praise the Lord. May the Lord grant us that grace and strength that this song will be a reality in our lives in Jesus' name. Let's please bow our heads to pray. Why don't you tell the Lord in one sentence, Lord, I want to go there. I want to be in heaven too. That nothing will take me away or make me to lose focus. Please pray that prayer. If that's the only prayer I'm going to pray today, please pray that prayer. I say, Father, I want to make heaven. Close your eyes, everybody. Youth, children, close your eyes and tell God, heaven is the reality. Heaven is the real place. And tell the Lord, Lord, I want to make heaven. I want to go there. And ask the Lord to give you that grace and that strength. All that you need to do. All that you need as a Christian, as a child of God, to make heaven. That the Lord will give it to you. Lord, grant me that grace. Grant me that, uh, that intensity of faith. That diligence. That fervency. That commitment. That consistency. That watchfulness. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And so, Lord, we want to appreciate your love, your mercies, and your goodness towards us. We want to express our profound gratitude to you for the privilege you have given unto us to tarry in your presence since Thursday. You're sitting at your feet, hearing you speak to us, and rebuking, correcting, chastising, pruning, and taking away things that are not all God ought to be in our lives. Father, we've come to the climax, which is the ultimate goal, is the focus this morning. The reason why we pray, the reason why we are fasting, the reason why we are waiting on you, the reason why we abstain, and the reason why we decide, O oh God, Father, to go away from the things which, O oh God, are ephemeral, mundane things of this world, is because ultimately we know there's a place prepared for us, a better place called heaven. Lord, that grace that we will be a partaker of that, O oh God, uh, uh, abode, give it to us in Jesus' name. The songwriter says, I've heard about mansions far beyond compare. I've heard about a place called heaven. He wants to go there. Also, we want to be there. That grace that will keep us focused to the end, give it to us in Jesus' name. Strengthen us, dear Lord, and uphold us, everlasting Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise, Praise the Lord. The Lord. Let's turn our Bible to Matthew, Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. The gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. And we are looking at the message titled, Living in the Light of Eternity. Living in the Light of Eternity. Uh, the goal before us in life dictates the way we live our life. The student who wants to make an A star in his exam uh, is quite evident when you compare him to a student who just wants to just pass and go. It's also quite distinct from a student who doesn't really bother about school. An A star student, you discover that his focus and his attention will be in his books. He doesn't have too, too many, many excesses. Doesn't, doesn't have, have time, time for frivolities. He spends spend hours, hours and hours in the library. He doesn't con, 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 uh, restrict himself only to the syllables or the things the teachers or the lecturer give him. He spends extra time on personal study and personal research. And he doesn't have time for clubbing and other things which distract their attention. He focuses on the thing that's going to help him to excel. The businessman also wants to make success of his money. He is prudent with his money. And any little money he comes, he sits down and calculates and says, This one, I can put it back to the business and multiply that to get more profits. And the same thing, too, someone who is very particular about her health. She's careful and selective in what he or she eats. And she takes time to define, Oh, this one is too much calories. Now, why did I give you this illustration? It's important because as Christians as believers, it's time for us to sit back and reflect that if we're going to live with eternity in view, we have to be intentional in decisions we make. We have to be deliberate in the choices we make. We also have to be clear in our focus in the things we do. And may the Lord grant us that grace and that strength to walk with eternity in view in Jesus' name. 
Let's open our Bible to Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to verse 27. I read, Therefore, whosoever heareth this saying of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon the rock. And every one that heareth this saying of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Praise the Lord. In this parable, Christ speaks about two houses. He said one house was built upon a rock, and the second house was built upon the sand. But he didn't tell us in terms of the architectural design of the house, but the conjecture or the conclusion from this text is very obvious. That both houses are the same, the same in terms of design. But those both houses uh, both houses were skillfully and strongly built. In actual appearance, they are the same. And when you see the house that was built upon the rock and the one that was built upon the sand, similar outward appearance, similar design, and similar texture. You cannot discern which house is built upon the built upon the sand or built upon the rock just by looking at the physical appearance. But the only difference, or what would make the difference, is when the wind comes, when the rain comes, when the storm comes. The wind, the rain, and the storm will be able to make a clear distinction if this house A was built upon the sand or house B was built upon the rock. In essence, Christ is trying to tell us that the hypocrites and those who are, who pre who are pretentious Christians, it's when the wind of eternity will blow. When the rain of eternity will blow, that's when your, the, the foundation upon which you build your, 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 your life will become, become evidence. evidence. Right? Right. All, All the, the faith, faith of the hypocrites, his fear will be made manifest when the wet, windy storm of eternity blows. And therefore, from that text, you see the Bible is admonishing us that to be a wise builder is not just be those who hear the word. The frequent hearer is not a wise builder. The wise builder is the faithful hearer, the persons that hear the word and do exactly what God has told him to do and walk in that aspect. So there are two lessons we, read, we, we can gain from this text, Matthew chapter 7. Number one, that the obedient believer is the only wise man that built his hope of heaven upon a sure and abiding foundation. You build your hope of heaven upon a foundation that is unshakable. For example, those who, who tend to follow traditionalists, those who tend to follow other faiths, and with the hope of gaining everlasting life, they are building their faith on a faulty and false foundation. The Bible says there is no other way given unto men wherein we can receive except through the name Jesus Christ. Those who are professors of faith that rest in outward performances of holy duties and full, they are foolish builders. Purely builders, there is no hope of eternity or eternal life in their life. Let's look at the, another text, Mark chapter 8, verse 36. The Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 8, verse 36 and verse 37. He said, For what shall it profit a man if he, gain, if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Verse 37. He said, What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? These are powerful words coming from Christ. Christ sat back with the disciple to press home the importance and the power 
or oh, sorry, the import of eternity. How important eternity is, especially eternity with God in heaven. He equated the soul of a man with the wealth of the world. He said, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world? Brothers and sisters, uh, don't go very far from it. Don't go very far. Just come home closely. Imagine the biggest shop here in, the, in Newcastle. Probably Costco. And uh, you go to Costco, or maybe something more, more bigger than Costco, uh, probably bigger than Costco, uh, Corries. They have gadgets. And they say they give you everything in Corries. And say it's yours. It's worth millions. Imagine all the shops in the, tra in the shopping mall called Metro Center. And they give you everything in that shopping mall. It says it's yours. Yeah. For the next 10 years, you don't need to work. And the money and the wealth from that shop, the millions, will be yours. And imagine, let's extend it, not just in Metro Center, everything in Newcastle, everything in the Northeast is yours. They give it to you. It's coming down to billions. And they say, that's all those property are yours. And you can have it. Let's, by stretch of imagination, let's go beyond the North East and say everything in England. You just imagine even the wealth in the Bank of England, the Central Bank, Bank of England. The billions that is there, not trillions, it's yours. We give it to you. And you can have it all throughout your, all throughout your life. All throughout your life, your children, your grandchildren, your posterity, that wealth is kept there. And let's even extend it a little bit, the entire continent of Europe. The wealth there, United Kingdom, in Europe, everywhere, in Germany also, they give it to you. We are not even talking about in North America or in Asia or in Africa, the wealth and the resources there. And God says, in comparison, if you are given all the wealth of this continent, right? You put it on the scale, your soul on one side of the scale, and the wealth of the world on the other side of the scale. You say your soul will tip the scale. You say it's nothing comparable that what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Nothing. That tells you how invaluable your soul is. The question is, if the soul is that important, you need to sit back and reflect what, and look at eternity. And um, talking about eternity, what is eternity? Eternity is a time without beginning or a time without an end. When we're talking about eternity, we're talking about God's own life itself. It's a pitless past and live forever and ever. Eternity is an infinite time, right? A writer once liking eternity, right? Trying to give us a graphical image of what eternity is. He said, if it were possible for you to ask uh, a boy to empty, empty the North Sea, the Atlantic Ocean, and you give the boy a teaspoon and say, each time you go, Take a teaspoon of water, walk down to the desert, Sahara Desert, empty it, right? You know how long it's going to take that child to walk from the sea to the desert and empty one teaspoon. He said the time it takes to finish emptying the ocean is a fraction of eternity. He said if it were possible to tie a rope from earth to the sun and ask the ants, you know how many million light years it is in terms of distance? and ask the sun to go that distance from the earth to the sun he said the time it go it takes for the sun it's the ants to go to the sun and come back a million times is a fraction of eternity brothers and sisters eternity is a timeless state following death and no wonder moses prayed this prayer in deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 29 let's open to it and see the prayer that moses prayed Moses prayed this prayer in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 29. He said, Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their later end. Moses was speaking concerning the children of Israel. He said, For if they could, if they are wise enough to consider their, their, their later end, Many times we don't consider our later end. The natural man only considers the now, the immediate gain. Do you know the reason why they pay chief executive, CEO, multi-million pounds? CEO, right? If in the bank, 
in the industry, in company, who does the job? In Amazon, for example, who does the job? Those who are carrying the packages and unwrapping and delivering, they are the people who do the job, right? But they get peanuts compared to the CEO who is there up there. The CEO sit down in his office and they get millions and they call what they call uh, bonuses. They give them at the end of the year, they give them large bonuses. But you know the, the reason why they pay them this much? They pay them because they think in decades. They plan ahead. And they pay them so much because um, they don't just pay, uh, uh, pay them because they sit in that office as CEO, no. They sit down and look at the market trends. Where do we diversify to? The next one year, five, five years, ten years. And the more you are able to think strategically, the more salary you will earn as an individual. So that when you're looking for a job, if you're looking for a job like a cleaner come home, his own job is for that day, clean, and that's the end. They pay you according to the strategic thinking you bring to the organization. Your strategic capacity as, as a staff, if your job is just to go, just uh, do one, two things, connect wires, and the job is done for that day, they'll pay you for that stuff you do. Uh, you come to the hospital setting, some of the uh, NHS manager, the end, more even than the doctors who are there, because they sit down and look at plans for the year, for the next five years, for the next ten years. That's what they do, and that's what the world rewards. The natural man only thinks of now, the immediate gain, what he or she would benefit at the present moment. And that's why I want you to sit back, church. Sit back and reflect. Go beyond the now and look at the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, eternity. Where will you spend eternity? And that's the reason why we should sit down and look at our life. And this message builds a framework for thinking God higher thoughts. Thinking God to use us, right, to help us to use our time on earth wisely. And one man prayed that prayer, David, in Psalm 90 verse 12. He prayed that prayer that God help me to use my time wisely. Let's look at Psalm 90 and look, let's look at verse 12. Psalm 90 verse 12. Psalm 90 verse 12. It says, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. To number our days. So teach me to number my days, that I may apply my heart unto wisdom. Right? So that David was praying this prayer in considering the shortness of life, in meditating about heaven. He understood that the life he is living is quite short. So, he deeply considered how frail life is, how short life is, how uncertain life is. He now prayed that prayer. Oh Lord, that I will live for eternity, helping to acquaint myself with thee, to be at peace with thee, so that when I die, I will die in the place of favor. So that when I die and you call me home, I will die in the sight of favor and live and reign with thee eternally. And that's why Paul recalled this thought in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 16. He says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And in Colossians chapter 4 verse 5, Paul re-emphasized this by saying, we should walk in wisdom towards them that are without redeeming the time. So the question is, how do we redeem the time? We redeem the time by living in light of eternity. How do we redeem the time? We redeem the time when we learn how to focus on eternal results of our labor. Look up, church. That anything you are doing in life, your labor, you are laboring in life, look at the eternal result of your labor. Now, is this labor worthwhile? This thing I'm pursuing. And there's some certain battles that are not worthwhile. Any battle that's not going to define your eternity is not worth fighting. Right? Any venture that's not going to help you to be able to what, make a mark in the footprints of time is not, it's not worth laboring and pursuing for. And you could pursue your career goal, no doubt. 
need that for, for existence, existentialism. But other things that have great in, greater importance, you don't really give them to the background. And that's why he prayed that prayer. Let's look at Mark chapter 8, verse 36 again. We read it before. He said, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Amen. Brothers and sisters, if it's possible to gain the whole world and keep your soul, oh yes, for she votes. For she votes. But it's not possible. Right? The God of Mammon, we're taking the Mammon father and father and father and father away. And it's taking it away close to it, taking it away from you to the ditch. So that because your eyes is focused on that mammon and you're not looking at the ground, you come to a point whereby the person will fall into that ditch. A savior had shown in this in the verses, verses before verse 36 and 37 the great danger of seeking for temporal things or to save our temporal life, exposing ourselves to the hazard of eternal life. Right, he confirms in the world before us what we call double argument. Double argument. Number one, argument. He drew and showed us the excellency of eternal life. The eternal life is quite invaluable. It's something that you should not compromise. The life of the soul. Double argument. The second argument is this. It tells us that one's loss is irrecoverable that the life you live now one's loss is impossible to, look to, to regain them again it's impossible to redeem them again and that's why i said what shall a man give in exchange for his soul that soul once lost you cannot regain them back again the lesson here are this that the almighty god has entrusted every one of us with a soul everybody has a soul and that soul you have will live forever that soul we have is inestimable it's all through eternity once lost it's lost all through eternity once gained it's also gained all through eternity so understand that you have a soul and the gain of the whole world is not comparable with that loss and may the lord grant us that grace to treasure our soul in jesus name May the Lord grant us that grace to treasure our soul in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's look at the message under three subheading. The first one, the brevity and weariness of life. The brevity and weariness of life. Brothers and sisters, the life is brief. And it's also empty, very tiring. And that's why people say, I want to retire. Because you have labor, 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 you get to an age, you know what? I want to retire. Um, and that retirement time, you think it's the time for, for rest. But the, the, the world have drained your youthful age and strength. And they abandon you when you are tired and old. That's the world for you. The second subheading is the best way to live. We've seen, we're going to see the brevity and weariness of life. And let's look at the best way to live. What's the best way to live? And finally, the benefits of a worthy life. Any benefits for a worthy life? We're going to see if there's a benefit. And let's look at the first point again, the brevity and weariness of life. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 29. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 29. It says, But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as do they have none. The time is short. Brothers and sisters, life on earth is very short. If you look through the Bible, the Bible uses various words to describe the brevity of life. In Job chapter 8 verse 9, Job describes it as a shadow. A shadow. You see, a shadow that trails off at the set of the sun. You see a shadow cast 
right. Once the sun comes, it trails off. But when the light comes, the shadow disappears. In the same Job chapter 7, verse 6, and Job, I come at, I, I see him as someone who observes and look at events in life and used to make a description about realities. In Job chapter 7, verse 6, Job described life as swifter than a weaver's shuttle. When I sat back, I was researching on what a weaver's shuttle meant. You know, before the advent of the machines that make clothes, and traditional weavers, they have this shuttle they use, they push, push through the loop, and put their, they put their the, 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 uh, threads around it, and they use it to weave their clothes. And for those of them who are very fast, right, that shuttle goes in and out, in and out of their beam. And that's how they make that garment. And Job sat down and said, the time it takes the weaver to put the shuttle through from one end to the other is quite fast. He said, life is shorter than the weaver's shuttle, which passes in a moment from one end of the web to the other end of the web. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 24, for, uh, Peter brought it closer to us to liken it to a flower. He said, the, he said, life is like the flower that soon fades away. When spring, now if you look carefully, some plants are started springing out and bringing out flower. Between now and the month of May, you see the whole place beautiful, the flower glowing. And as you go to a summer, June, July, you see oh, how beautiful the place is. If you take photos, around these streets you are seeing now how radiant that photograph will look like and how resplendent also your image will look in the background with that photo but give it autumn this flower will fade away give it winter you will not even see a leaf on the tree again let alone flowers and that's what job says sorry that's what peter said he said life is like a flower that soon fades away and in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 29, we are made to understand that it is very short. 1 Corinthians 7, 29. That life is very short. It says, but I say, brethren, the time is short. Everybody said the time is short. Very short indeed. And the time we find ourselves here is quite very short. And that's the more reason why we should apply our hearts with wisdom as the psalmist prayed. I prayed. So we are reminded that death can occur at any age, as we can see, right? And read daily from the news, right? Children die, adults die, babies die. If there's a guarantee that no death till you get to the age of 70, you can live carelessly when you are 69 years old. By the 69 year, you give your life to Christ and live only one year for Christ. There's, there's no certainty that death must come at old age. Death can come at any time. And see what Job said concerning life. I said Job is a great thinker. Look at Job chapter 14 verse 1 and 2. In Job chapter 14 verses 1 and 2, hear what it says. It says, man that is born of a woman is of few days and full of troubles. Let's read verse 2 together. One to read. He cometh forth like a flower and is caught down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. Man that is born of a woman is of few days and full of trouble. That is a reality. You realize the brevity of life. When someone you spoke to recently, they tell you the person has not died. You say, what? I just spoke to her last week. I just spoke to him last month. And when we traveled last time, I saw him. He was healthy. Nothing was wrong with him or her. That's the brevity of life, church. And that's why the psalmist says in Psalm 89 verse 47, Remember how short my time is. What man is he that liveth and shall not see death? Brothers and sisters, life is short. Compared to eternity, and we are reminded daily that death is for everyone. In the light of brevity of life, we need to live every day as though it may be our last. May God grant us grace and strength to live such life in Jesus' name. Why do we need to live as if it's our last? 
that will motivate us to live for eternity. That will motivate us to prioritize things. That will motivate us not to, not to engage in selfish pursuits. Things that's not going to bring blessings. Life is a series of problems. Either you are in one, or you are coming out of one, or you are about to go into one. And so people will use problem as an excuse not to work for God. Sometimes I wonder why they use it as an excuse. Because there will be one challenge or the other. It's all different from degree. Every person sitting next to the person sitting next to you have his own challenge. Right? If you think your own challenge is heavy, I say, ask the person next to you who exchange. Praise the Lord. The idea is that there are challenges that you cannot bear. You might think that, oh, this person's challenge is lighter. Who say it's not lighter? God has given you grace. And the grace of God is sufficient for you in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. That takes us to the second message, the best way to live. What's the best way to live? How do we live? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16. Let's open to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16. What's the best way to live? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16. Let's back it up to verse 15. Verse 15 says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Let's read verse 16 together. Want to read? Redeeming the time because the days are evil. One more time, please. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Amen. How do we live? Number one, you, you, you walk circumspectly. I will explain that. You walk circumspectly. The best way to live is to walk, live circumspectly. What does it mean to live circumspectly? There are three, uh, three, what I call it, uh, uh, words I'm going to use as synonyms to describe that. Number one is watchfulness. Watchfulness. If you live in a neighborhood where the neighborhood is a very rough neighborhood, your approach to things and the way you do things will be different from someone who lives in a neighborhood that there's no single crime there. You will be watchful. You will shut your door before going out. You pull the blinds. You ensure that the keys are not left, right, in an, in, in an awkward place. You are watchful. And if there's any noise, you're constantly watch, you watch. And sometimes you might invest in a uh, hawk eye, what they call CCTV camera. And you put that there to watch. And now the system has made it so possible that you can have it on your mo on an app. And you're constantly watching. Why? Because you're living in a neighborhood that is quite very nefarious. And that's what the Bible says. As a Christian, be watchful. My brothers and sisters, be watchful. Be watchful of your words. Be watchful of your actions. Be watchful of your character. Be watchful of your habits. Be watchful of your thoughts. Be watchful of situations and encounters you come across or people you come across. Be watchful. God has called us to watchfulness. This circumspect also means be discreet. Be discreet in terms of the way you do things, right? Don't just live carelessly, but deliberate in the, the things you do, your actions. And being circumspect also means to be cautious, be careful. The Bible says, an adversary like the devil walketh about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Be cautious. Be circumspect also means to be prudent, be wise. Don't act foolishly. Be wise in the things you do. And the, the apostle is asking us not to act as fools but as wise. Redeeming the time. Redeeming the time means what you have lost. There are some of us who give our life to Christ much older. Why some give our Christ quite tender. Thank God for our youth. And I pray that God will keep them. They will continue in this faith in Jesus' name. For those who don't have that godly parentage, who never give their life to Christ in a very tender age, right? It's a time for you to redeem the time. Say that those years that I've spent, I've lost those years, and I give it to the devil. I will trade them back. I will redeem the time. For every one day I lost to the to the to sin, 
happen to Satan, I will make it fine for God. I want to pay back time. I want to give God back quality time. And God will grant you grace to do that in Jesus' name. Right? Uh, talking about redeeming the time, see what John Wesley says. I quote, According to him, he says, Saving all the time you can for the best purposes. Buying up every fleeting moment out of the hands of sin and Satan. Out of the hands of sloth, that is laziness. Out of the hands of ease, pleasure, worldly business. The more diligently, because these are evil days. Days of the gross ignorance, immorality, and profanity. Unquote. And George Whitefield said he could not lie down in the bed for a night if he did not know that even his gloves were in, in their place. Diligence. Ensuring things are meticulously done. And Micah chapter 6 verse 8 tells us God's duty, God's call for us, what God has placed us here on earth for. Right? With Micah chapter 6 verse 8. Hear what Micah says. He said, He had showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Amen. To walk humbly with thy God. God has put us on earth to develop our characters. And there will be situations and circumstances that will actually test your characters. God has put us on earth to test our faithfulness. And God will intentionally bring you in the pathway of things that will test that faithfulness. May, may we get ready for eternity. Because all these things are designed to help us to get ready for eternity. So number one, the best way to live. Number one, work circumspectly. Number two, set our hearts on eternal things. Tell somebody next to you, set your heart on eternal things. Say it louder. Set your heart on eternal things. Open to Colossians chapter 3 verse 1. In Colossians chapter 3 verse 1, hear what the Bible says. Colossians chapter 3 verse 1, 1 to 3. You see, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ seated on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. Amen. Here, Paul is reminding us that we need to set our hearts on eternal things. And to put heaven's priorities into daily practice. Heaven priorities into daily practice. The question is, how best can we do that? What are the practical ways we can do that? I'll give you five ways you can do that. Five steps you need to take and five practical ways you need to do so that you can set your heart on heavenly things. Number one, recognize your position. What did I say? Look at what it said in verse 1, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ. Did you get that? If ye then be risen with Christ. You are raised. When you give, give your life to Christ, you are born again. You have been raised. You are risen and you are lifted with Christ. Like somebody who has been promoted to a higher level. Right? He has left secondary school in the university. He said, you know what? I miss my college and he's going back to that school again. What are you doing here? I just miss the French, the environment. No. You are no longer here. You have been risen. Lord, someone who has been discharged from the hospital. And the doctor has certified your feet. He said, we we'll check the scan. We've done the test. We've done the x-ray. You are, you are fine. And you are coming back again to the hospital. You say, why? You know, I just missed the hospital food. That bed is just nice. I want to sleep there. No, you're not supposed to be here. Right? Here, Bible says that you are risen with Christ. Amen? So if you are risen with Christ, recognize your position. Sin shall not have dominion over your life. Unrighteousness shall not have dominion over your life. So that's the first thing you should recognize. Number two, reorder your priorities. What did I say? Right? How things of eternal value should take precedence. 
over the mundane. Things of eternal value should be priority in my life. And you sit down to actually give yourself a hard evaluation. How do I spend my time? What do I engage my time for? Is it on TikTok, on Facebook, on YouTube, and you are there, you are not making impact for eternity. You are not doing anything for God. Church, you can't live your life that way. How comfortable are you? you? Just come in on Sunday and you go back again. The only time we see is next Sunday again. How comfortable are you? Pursuing money, 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 no time for God. Even to take a little broom or duster, let me come and do the house of God. It's nothing to you. Reorder your priorities. Number three, reorder your goals. Look at that verse. You see, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above right where christ seated on the right hand of god reorder your god means to set it very high you see aim for the stars if you miss you get the moon don't aim for things of you then things aim for heaven heaven is your goal you're not aiming for the stars the sky is not your limit. Heaven is your limit. Aim for heaven. So reorder your goals. Any goal that is not big enough to take you to heaven, it ends worth pursuing. Number four, reposition your interests. Let's go back to that text again. Look at verse two. Let's read verse two together. Are we there? One, two, read. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Reorder your interests. Reposition your interests right it's good to work it's good to make money those things are fine but reposition it because christ says seek you first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you god knows you know, you need them god wants you to seek after them but not at the expense of your soul not at the expense of your soul reposition your interest and number uh, number six right reflect on your identity what did i say reflect on your identity look at that verse three let's read verse three together one to read for ye are dead and your life is hid with christ in god one more time look up church i hope this one is going to make impact in your life when you become born again, you know what God did? God took your life and hid your life in Christ and hid that life in God. So when they see you, it's not you they are seeing. They are seeing Christ. But some of us want to take off Christ and take off God as they see me. That's when self start manifesting. No, it's not you. Your life is hid with Christ inside God. It's a threefold casing. You have been encased. The Holy Spirit is already inside of you. And God is saying, that's not enough seal. And put you inside Christ. You see, that's not enough seal. And pick you and the Holy Spirit and Christ and put it inside of yourself. Triplefold casing. And when you have that recognition and that identity in your heart that my life is hid inside Christ with God, then your dispositions your actions your priorities your portions your goals your ambitions we align with this knowledge with this truth many years back i was traveling somewhere my abroad my usual practice is to preach in the bus on this particular occasion usually the best time to preach is when the bus is probably hits the highway and is going you clear your throat and you start preaching. So I take a vantage position. I took a sat at the back. This probably is 17 or 18 or 19 or 20 something like that. I've forgotten the details now. So I took a vantage position there getting ready to preach. Um, all the preparation and everything. And we packed somewhere and we were going to buy bread. And I gave my money to somebody to pick some for me. And while instead of giving me the bread, the woman went away with the money. Sorry, sorry. 
went away with a, a girl's money which is in front of me, went away with her money. And she now collected my own money and put it in her own wallet. I said, I that's my own money. He refused. Now the natural instinct is to make case with her. She knew and everything. But the Holy Spirit reminded me, you are a preacher, you want to preach in the bus now. If you say anything, you are going to spoil the message. Let bread go. And that was my last money. I didn't have any money with me. And I, I obeyed the voice of the Holy Spirit. No money to. And I'm traveling from the south of the country to the north of the country. I didn't have any money with me. Nothing to buy anything with. I obeyed the voice of the Holy Spirit. And I cleared my voice. I preached. And I gave, and some people gave their life to Christ. We got uh, to the services. You know, they have services over there too. We got to the services. I went back to one of the services. Right? The girl without me telling her, came and made me say, was offering me the money back. I said, no, that's okay. Go with it. Why? I recognize that my life is here together with Christ. If I decide to insist, and she insists and start fighting me, I've lost the glory of Christ. I've lost, I've disgraced Jesus Christ. I put Jesus Christ to shame. What message do I have? No message. Brothers and sisters, in your home, when you're together with your husband and your wife, will reflect your identity. When you're together with your friends outside, reflect your identity. When you are with your classmates in the university, reflect your identity. When you are uh, in the streets, anywhere with, with people you don't know, with family members, reflect your identity. When you are with that stranger who wants to come and defile you, reflect your identity. That your life is hidden with Christ in God. Remember that identity that God has given to you. And God will help you mightily in Jesus' name. I'm asked, the message, the subheading is the best way to live. Number one, work circumspectly. Number two, set your heart on eternal things. Number three, uh, uh, number, uh, number three walk in newness of life walk in newness of life let's read Romans chapter 6 verse 4 in Romans chapter 6 verse 4 it says therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death did you get that? let's read it together Romans chapter 6 verse 4 1, 2, read therefore we are buried with him amen we are not there yet let's open to Romans chapter 6 verse 4 wait for us Romans chapter 6 verse 4 Praise the Lord. Let's read. One, two, read. By the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Now keep that on the screen. It says we are buried with him by baptism. And that's why we, we, we do water baptism. To identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. When you are lowered into the water, you are you died. You died in Christ. You are kept there for some few seconds, you are buried with him. As you are lifted out of the water, you resurrect with him. And God is telling us that we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also we should walk. In the newness of life, a new life has been given unto us. Second Corinthians chapter five verse seventeen affirms that if any man, uh, 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 Second Corinthians chapter five, uh, uh, chapter five verse seventeen tells us that that as we are in Christ, we are a new creature in Christ. All things ought to have been happening, and that means that God has called us to live, we live it to His glory in Jesus' name. Finally, what are the benefits of a worthy the benefits of a worthy life. Any benefits? If you choose to live a life of grace, a life of glory, a life that reflects Christ's image, are there any benefits to it? Yes. For the believer, for the Christian, death is not the end. You know, in recent times, I'm sure you probably heard the news, this country, there are some uh, pressure groups they are putting pressure on the government to allow euthanasia euthanasia is uh, that medical act where you kill somebody the person says he or she have been diagnosed with terminal sickness 
and the person is passing through pain and they cannot endure pain and the loved one will take her to the hospital and say doctor kill this person and let the person die and their reason for advocating for euthanasia is because of two reasons number one this person will die anyway so why allow the person pass through pain or to end all peace on our own life. Uh, because this country still holds that sanctity of life, and that sacred thing that life belongs to God, they are still pushing back. So what family does is to take them to countries where euthanasia is practiced, like Switzerland and some countries in Europe, and they go and end the life of that person. Uh, in the recent debate that we have, I think this is here, if I'm not mistaken, uh, who stood against euthanasia, some of them are backpaddling, they are suffering. You know, the devil is very wicked. The devil have a way of making certain issues seem uh, reasonable. For example, a woman came and said her husband is begging her that please end my life. And is crying, end my life, because he's passing through pain. And the painkiller is not working again. And the reason why they feel that death will bring the end of that pain is because of ignorance. Someone who is living in sin and he or she dies and goes to hellfire, will that stop the pain? Church, will that stop the pain? No. That's the beginning of the pain. Even the pain comes at a higher intensity. The Bible says, there the worm died not. Have you ever seen a fire that doesn't kill warm? That's the fire of hellfire. And that fire, the Bible says, that pain in terms of severity and intensity that the people will wish for death to come. I say, let me die and death will run away from me. Brothers and sisters, for you as a Christians, beloved of God, Death is not the end. Tell somebody next to you, death is not the end. You know what is death for a Christian? It's a changing room where we robe ourselves in glory. We robe ourselves in immortality. It's a changing room. It's not like, and like actress goes into the changing room. When the actress goes into the changing room, and she comes out of the stage, you don't the actress again. Because the rope and everything she puts on is totally different. Like our choristers came here, I didn't recognize them again. They came out in splendor. Amen. Let's put our hands together for them. Right? They came out in splendor. So when you as a as a Christian, right, pass through that experience called, called death, you come out in a changing rope, a new rope. Praise the Lord. It's a blessing to die in the Lord. Amen. Look at Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. Revelation chapter 14 verse 13. You don't mind projecting for us. See what the Bible says. It says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, say the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors. Amen. That they may rest from their labors. And their works to follow them. Look up, church. Some of you see this work serving God, say, well, I cannot combine being a worker and my and being the ch a church worker. My work is enough. The, the children are there to take care of and everything, right? Uh, the work, kitchen work is there for me and come here again to be a member of the choristers is too much for me. The Bible says a time of rest is coming. Eternally you rest from your labors. On this earth, there's labor. You have to labor, you have to work. You have to work because a time is coming, you will cease from labor. You walk, right? Your arm, but at that time, what will follow you? Your works. Look at that word in plural. Your works will follow you. And when God brings out the register and see what works will follow you, uh, was this person working for me? No. Was he coming to church? No. Was he doing that? Nothing to tick. No works follow you. So some person say, was must I go and take it? Must I meet my Savior's soul? Savior soul? Not even one soul with which to greet him. Not even one soul. 
May many works follow you in Jesus' name. So the many works follow you in Jesus' name. In Psalm 115, he says, How pleasant in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Amen? That is why we should sorrow not as though who have no hope. Whenever a saint depart from home, for they that believe in Christ, though they were dead, yet shall live again. Amen. Um, in John chapter 14, verse 1, Jesus Christ encouraged his disciples. He said, I'm going away, he told them. And they were sorrowful. He encouraged them, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Verse 3. For if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Amen. And God gave them a promise. What are the benefit benefits of a worthy life? The best place to take you to is 1 Corinthians 15. Let's open to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at verse 39. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 39. What are the benefits? Look up church. Certain things are difficult to explain or to illustrate. But certain things are better imagined. And certain things are better appreciated when the Holy Spirit impresses us on us. When I was looking at this verse, uh, these verses this morning, I saw how beautiful and how glorious the benefits of dying as a Christian will be. And also, to also make heaven eventually. Look at verse 9. He said, all flesh is not the same flesh. But there's one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another flesh of birds. There are also celestial bodies and also body terrestrials. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There's one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differed from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It shall be raised how? In incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. And it shall be raised how? In glory. It is sown in weakness. It shall be raised how? In power. It is sown in natural body. It is raised how? In spiritual body. Spiritual body, when Christ rose again, he doesn't need key to open the door. Christ will just come, the door is locked everywhere, will just come through the wall and say, All hail. And he says, Ghost. They say, No, it's not ghost. Do you have any fish here? Bring fish. Do you have any, any bread? Bring bread. Ghost does not eat. Come and touch me, Thomas. Come and feel my hand. Ghost do not have body. Glory. They went down to uh, they went, uh, went down to Jerusalem on the mount as he was talking to them. The Bible says he was telling them, Tarry in Jerusalem, as he was speaking to them, his body was being taken away. You don't require an airplane to travel again. You transcend, you go what we call the fourth dimension, fifth dimension. We find ourselves in two dimensional world now at the moment. The fourth dimension, the fifth dimension, you don't require a plane. As somebody was recently, was not recently, some time back, was uh, asking question, a skeptical question, say, why did God create all this universe? Just waste of time. Expanse universe. Why did God create it? It's not waste. Before the fall, God wanted Adam and Eve to conquer to rule. Places like Mars, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto will have just be holiday sites for you. Just say, I just came back from Uranus, Jupiter last time, going to spend holiday there. Right? All this planet, planetary body, you just go there. You don't need to find anything. All, all this is God created for us to have dominion over the earth. And God will restore this back again. Amen. Let's go back again to verse 44. It is sown in natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Verse 45. For it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was a quickening spirit. Amen. Verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Amen. Verse 53. When we are changed, what will happen to us? For this corruptible 
must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Let's read verse 57 together. I want to read. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the difference between you and the sinner. Christ have Christ's death on the cross have translated you from darkness to light. And so when you identify with that Christ, when death come upon mankind to bring an end to their life, you are exempted. Remember the story of children of Israel in Egypt. Just the mark of the blood on the door lintel was what spared them when the angel of death come. The identity of the blood, the, the lamb's blood upon you, will also spare you too, in Jesus' name. Therefore, my beloved brethren, let's read verse 58 together. I want to read. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Tell somebody next to you, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. In view of that, brothers and sisters, we should live in light of eternity. That God will give us the grace that we reorder our priorities in the things we'll do. That the Lord will grant us grace and strength to walk, to recognize our position, reorder our priorities, reorder our goals, reposition our interests, and that will reflect our true identity as Christians. Let's turn on our feet to pray. Let's ask the Lord to help us and give us the grace to teach us to number our days that we might apply our hearts to ask for grace ask for strength ask for power ask for wisdom that the lord will empower you the lord will enable you the lord will grant you that grace grant you that wisdom grant you that strength and that enablement to walk in truth and the righteousness yield your hearts and yield your life and commit yourself before the Lord that oh God help me oh Lord grant me the grace that the Lord will grant you that grace and that strength you're going to walk in obedience to his voice in obedience to his truth that the Holy Spirit will grant you that grace and that strength and that enablement The trump of God shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise, in a twinkle of an eye. The trump of God shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise, in a twinkle of an eye. Oh, in a twinkle, oh. Trump of God shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise in a twinkle of an eye. The trump of God shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise in a twinkle of an eye. Oh, in a twinkle. Oh. Of God shall sound, and the dead in pressure rise.
that go with grand children. Grace to watch the world, your actions, your character, your thoughts, your habits. If you are here, you've not given your life to Christ, my brothers and sisters, count yourself very lucky. Count yourself very fortunate that you are here. Don't lay your hand upon your chest. I'm going to pray for you now. Ask the Lord to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you. That the rapture have not taken place. That means you have a second chance. You have an opportunity. The rapture have not taken place. That shows that you, you still have a chance to be part of the people that will be raptured home. Why don't you present yourself before God and ask, Oh God, help me. Oh God, grant me grace. Oh God, grant me strength. Grant me the power to walk in obedience to your voice. To walk in the pathway of truth and righteousness. And Lord, that you give me the grace I will continue steadfastly before you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Father, I pray for this one who have given their life to you. The grace to walk with you, give it to them. The grace to walk in obedience to your voice, give unto them. Uphold them in the kingdom. Grant them strength to walk in accordance to your will. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. For the rest of us Christians, I want us to bow our heads and pray and ask the Lord to encourage you that you will not give up. Say, Lord, strengthen my hands. Lord, strengthen my heart. And give me the grace to continue steadfastly in the faith. May the lab may my labor follow me. Good works follow me. That I will continue steadfastly in service and in grace and in truth and righteousness. That the Lord will uphold you.